your uh, the deer you shot. Could you walk us through that a little bit, like that kind of hunt and how, how you end up shooting it? Yeah. Um, so like I said, I mean, they, they just went and this is, if you hired an outfitter to take you on a drop hunt and they dropped you in this area, you'd be real mad. Yeah. <laughs> you'd call them and say, come get me. <laughs> there just, there just wasn't very many deer there. Um, and so I don't know, I killed that deer, I think on like day 21 or 22 or something like mm-hmm. that. And I think maybe just a couple of days before that I had seen my first like really fresh deer sign. Uh, and it was in a little, like m- most of my stand was lodgepole. Um, and if, if, if you're a Western hunter and, and you're familiar with that type of habitat, it's just not a very productive habitat. You know, you've got the trees, there's very little browse underneath. It's, it's mm-hmm. not diverse at all. Um, but there were these little isolated depressional wetlands where they would be other things. They'd be like wild roses and different sedges and, and um, snowberry and different things like that. And I was walking through one of those areas one day and I found some deer, uh, deer pellets from that morning. And I wasn't exact, I wasn't sure exactly where I was. And so I, I scouted around a little bit. Um, but this, this wetland that I was in was very small. I mean, it's quarter acre or so. And I thought the deer might still be in there, but it was at the time, it was at a time of day when the wind was pretty shifty. And so instead of pushing it and, and trying to find those deer that day, I just backed out. And just to be safe, because I didn't want to run them out because, I mean, if there had been more deer, I probably would have pushed it. But with, with so little deer, um, I didn't want to run them out of there. So I backed out, came back a few days later and found some more fresh deer sign. And I, I basically was just still hunting um, and still hunting. For those ho- of you who aren't familiar with it, it's basically you're just you're moving through the woods um very, very slowly through likely areas, uh, keeping an eye and ear out. You're trying to detect an animal before they detect you. Um, and you know, you might, you might move a hundred yards and it might take you an hour or two to to move that hundred yards. Um, and so I was, I was still hunting my way through this area and I had this red squirrel jump up a tree, just I don't know, 10 feet from me and start churring and barking at me. And so I just squatted down, just wanted to let the woods settle down a little bit. And when I stood up, this little buck that I ended up killing, he must have been looking at that red squirrel. And he, he either heard me or saw me, but he didn't know what I was. He bounded off. He was like, he stopped at like 40 yards. And where I was, there was not a stitch of cover. I mean, I didn't have anything. And so I just froze. He stopped at like 40 yards and looked back over his shoulder. And by some miracle, it was a spike, which was the absolute (laughs) perfect animal to run into because he looked at me. You know how they do. They look and they do their head like this and they stomp and they turn around. Well, he kept doing that and until he just came to the conclusion that I wasn't anything to be worried about and started browsing. He put his head down behind the brush and I, I got down on a knee and I let him get a little bit more comfortable. And then I grunted at him with my voice and he threw his head up and did that whole head bobbing thing again. And then he started kind of just easing his way to me browsing and he stopped at 25 yards with his head behind a tree. I mean, perfect. The only tree between me and him, he stopped with his head behind it. (laughs) I said, man, it ain't going to get no better than that. And so I come back to full draw and by, you know, another lucky break that I had is I've got a, I've got a deer target that's 25 yards from my back door. And I make that shot every single day. I just made that same shot that I make every day and it freaking pinwheeled him. And he, (laughs) he went about 50 yards and piled up in a, um, in a little, little meadow. And I tell you, I've killed a lot of animals with a stick bow and I have never experienced the kind of emotions that I experienced at that time. Um, I mean, nothing even remotely close. 
because that deer, I mean, at that time, I, that's the show right there. That's, I mean, that's why that's, it's so emotional. Yeah. That, I mean, that's everything, but the, I think the, the big reason it was so emotional to me is because I was so like, I was, I'd caught a few, so I'd shot a grouse on like day two or something like that. I'd caught, I think four or five fish by that time. I'd found some mushrooms and some like wild carrot, little, little bitty wild carrots the size of your pinky. And so you, you think about eating, you know, four fish this big, one grouse and some mushrooms for three weeks. You're freaking hungry. Yeah. And not only that, I couldn't, I hadn't caught, by the time I shot this deer, I hadn't caught a fish in a week, even though I'd fished every single day, I just couldn't catch a fish. And so I had smoked that, that extra fish I had, I had smoked the fillets and I was running out of meat. And so in my mind, I'm thinking, man, like I can't, it, my time here is coming to an end. They are going, I'm going to lose too much weight. They're going to pull me for malnutrition. And then that's one thing I forgot to mention. If you get in, if your body condition deteriorates too far, they'll pull you off the show for medical reasons. And so I'm thinking this is what, this is my fate. And so I'm stressed out with knowing that the end is coming. And then when that, when I shoot that deer and I round the corner in the grass and see that little buck lying there, it's like, Oh my God, like the weight of the world is lifted off my shoulders, man. I was on top of the world. Yeah. Were you yeah. Uh, allowed to hunt uh, black bears? No, unfortunately not. And, and, um, I didn't, I saw one black bear track on my beach. I never saw the bear. Um, I could now grizzlies. I could have killed several grizzlies. Uh, with my bow, but of course that was not allowed either. So what could you hunt? Um, they, deer well, they, one, right? Deer, one, you had one deer um, and rabbits gra and grouse. They were uh, spruce grouse and rough grouse there. I think that was it. It's not a lot of stuff. It's a, it's, it's a hard area and um, you know, people ask me if I would ever do it again. That's one of the most common questions people ask me. And I say, I wouldn't go back there again because, yeah. um, you know, historically people never lived there full time because it, mm -hmm. you just can't, I mean, it's not, you, it's not a place that you can support yourself. Um, now if, if, if I was, uh, I, I would consider doing it again, get given a different location where you have better, uh, hunting and fishing opportunities. Yeah, I think yeah, I would. the same thing. If it's bad for you, it's bad for everybody else. So it's still just a matter of how long you survive. But a little of luck's involved in it too. Yeah, but at, I mean, for for me and my skill sets, like I can't. I'm not going to be able to outstarve anybody. Mm -hmm. uh, my skill set is hunting, um, and to a much lesser extent, fishing. And so, you know, if I had if I had an area where the hunting opportunities were more, I I would feel I'd feel good about going back there. When when uh, you ended up uh, getting the news that you won, you looked like you were just about to tap out from my eyes, from my view. And uh, the guy that came close to getting you, the second place person, I think most of what he did was because of the weight he gained. Yeah, that, so one of the things that alone is as real as it gets. I mean, they drop you, there's nothing fake about the experience of being out there. They drop you off and they... I mean, it's up to you to sink or swim. But with that said, they will kind of fiddle with the timeline and, and kind of fiddle with the footage that they give you or that mm. you give them a little bit to try to create. Keep it that exciting. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Exactly. And so um, one of the things that they said, which never happened, was they, they said that I ran out of deer meat. I, I never ran out of deer meat. I, I came out with like 10 pounds. And I even <laughs> when oh. I, if, if you watch that last clip of the series when I'm getting on the helicopter, you can actually see two grouse dangling off my backpack. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I had food and I, there was, I was not going to quit anytime soon. Okay. Um, I could have made it. I, I said, I could have made it to day 90 and that would have been, you know, I could have done that without issue. And if I had kept, you know, towards the end of the season, I was catching, um, I was catching rabbits and grouse in my snares. And then I was also shooting grouse with my bow and if that had continued, I could have made it, 
you know, past a hundred days, um, I feel pretty certain. And correct me if I'm wrong, but wasn't it uh, you that had the issue with a fisher eating your rabbits out of your traps? Yeah, but that's another thing that, um, Josh, you'll get, if you haven't got there yet, you'll get there in the book. Um, yeah, <laughs> that, that's another Halfway. thing that, that's another thing that they kind of manipulated a little bit. Um, they, they, I think they used some of my voiceover from somewhere else to make it look like I was trying to run that Fisher off. <laughs> so, <laughs> no. um, I actually, the, the Fisher was super cool. And I like, I really enjoyed having him like in, in camp. I mean, he would come to my camp like every single night for the last two weeks I was there. And he would get like, if I had rabbit bones or grouse bones or rabbit guts or something like that, I'd leave them right outside the door and he'd come every single night and get those things. And this fisher had, I feel pretty confident saying he'd never seen a person before. So he, he, I, he became so accustomed to me that he would, he'd be walking around three feet from me. Um, and he even tried to come in the shelter on a couple of occasions. And I had to, it's like, man, there's not enough room in here for both of us. You just stay out there. <laughs> um, but I really look forward to every, every evening he would come, I'd, I'd stay up and wait for him. Um, and I, I look forward to that because it was just, it was almost like having a dog around camp. You know, he's just, yeah, oh, yeah. Me to talk to. <laughs> yeah. like, like Dan's coons. Yeah. yeah I, actually, on a wilderness hunt I went on, I had a, um, a red fox that came and hang out with us and would eat cookies out of her hands, would jump in the yep. truck with me. I wanted to drive it home with me. It was like my buddy. <laughs> so I um, come. It's kind of, it's kind of cool. 